All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. Welcome to the Environmental Law Institute. I'm Brett Cordy. I'm the manager of professional education, and you're here to hear um, the basics of land use law, part of our summer school series, which is co-sponsored by the DC Bar's Environment, Energy, and Natural Resource section. Uh, just a few uh, comments before we get started. Our speakers let me know that we will be pausing periodically uh, for questions throughout the talk today. For those of you in the room, uh, when he does that, just raise your hand and make sure that I can get this mic to you before you talk. That way we can capture all the audio for those listening remotely. And for those of you on the webinar, uh, please submit your questions through GoTo's question box. Uh, please submit those as you think of them. I'll pass them on to Jim uh, at the appropriate time, but please do not hold questions until the end. Send, th send them to me as you think of them. Um, as always, a full speaker bio is available on our website, and for this particular seminar, we also have links to some very useful other resources uh, that Jim has put together for us, so please do visit the event webpage at www.eli.org. You can find the basics of land use law event page there and access those materials. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Uh, Jim McElfish is a senior attorney here at ELI and the director of our Sustainable U Use of Land program. Jim's work focuses on development choices and their links to land use, water resources, biological diversity, and infrastructure policy. As a national authority on NEPA and related land use topics, Jim has spearheaded research on coastal zone activities, renewable energy siting, enforcement, and conservation outcomes of land use planning. One of his particularly relevant publications is Nature Friendly Ordinances, a book designed to help uh, local decision makers take affirmative steps to conserve and restore bio biological diversity and in turn add environmental value to their regions and localities. On top of all of that, Jim serves as an adjunct professor at Virginia Tech's graduate land use program where he teaches land use law. And before joining ELI in 1986, Jim was a litigator in private practice and for the Department of Interior. He's a graduate of Dickinson College and Yale Law School. And with, with, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Jim. Jim, thanks so much. Thanks very much, Brett. Um, and thank you all for being here and those of you um, are on the, on the phone joining us. Um, I'd like to just, uh, for the folks in the room, ask you to raise your hand if you've taken any courses in uh, land use law or urban planning or uh, sustainability with reference to land use uh, as an undergraduate or a law student or in graduate school. Just how many have that sort of background? Okay, about a third of you uh, in the room. So th this area, at least from uh, uh, having had the academic background, will be uh, somewhat uh, new to those of you. Uh, there, I have to say that um, Neither in college nor in law school did I take any of these courses, so it is possible to learn this on your way up well enough to be allowed to teach it to uh, others, which is a reassuring thing, I think. Um, I, I did want to um, refer to the intersection between land use law and environmental protection. We're the Environmental Law Institute, not the Land Use Law Institute. but. The intersection is uh, profound, and um, the, there's been a burgeoning discovery, particularly in the United States, of the ways in which uh, land use law is carried out by local governments and state governments uh, can uh, do a lot to protect our environment. Our uh, books uh, group has published a substantial number of books, a couple of recent ones. I just wanted to hold up the product, right? Um, Protecting the Environment Through Land Use Law, Standing Ground by Professor John Nolan of the Land Use Law Center at Pace University Law School. Uh, John Nolan is a co-author of one of the standard uh, textbooks on land use law that's used in the law schools and planning schools, along with um, Dean Patty Salkin, who I'll also refer to in a minute. Uh, Professor Nolan's books, um, cover a whole range of land use topics. All the ones published by ELI have ground somewhere in the title. New ground, open ground, standing ground. This one is losing ground that deals with the effects of climate change and uh, disasters on, uh, uh, on land uses and how we make out. So a uh, set of great resources. And you could consult the Land Use Law Center at, at Pace, which has a great number of uh, resources uh, as well. Um, 
His co-author on the textbook is uh, Dean Patty Salkin, who has been uh, chair of the litigation committee for the American Planning Association for many years and is, is probably one of the uh, most dynamic uh, authorities in the land use law arena. And she has done us all the great favor of uh, creating a blog uh, of land use law which is sorted by topic. So if you find yourself interested in what's happening on renewable energy siting or telecommunications or adult businesses or whatever in its relation to land use law and tracking current developments, you can go to her blog, which is Law of the Land. It's a WordPress uh, blog, but if you just search Law of the Land, all one word, um, you'll get there, and it's a, it's a terrific resource that uh, Dean Salkin uh, has, has managed to maintain. A um, lot of aspects to land use law. Yolanda publishes a textbook that uh, Charles Har, Har and Michael Allen Wolf uh, have uh, done on land use law. Uh, smart growth and smart codes for all of you architect and urban design folks. Uh, Chad Emerson uh, did a nice design to a, a set, or nice uh, guide to a set of design principles that were pioneered by uh, the Zybeck Plater firm, uh, well known in uh, urban design and, and uh, new communities area. A couple of mine, nature friendly ordinances and a sequel nature friendly land use practices uh, also. And this is uh, just a set of things that I grabbed on my way in here. But it's a, it's a rich and developing field, um, and it's one where there's a great deal of experimentation because every local government in the United States is in some respect engaged in this kind of lawmaking opportunity. So, you know, we're not just looking at the federal Congress or the EPA uh, or even state legislatures. It's a, it's a rich uh, field indeed. Well, what I'm going to try to do is give an overview of uh, where land use law, and, and my remarks are confined uh, largely to the United States practice, although in the questions or discussion we can try to venture uh, beyond the borders if, if you want to do so, and I'll do the best of my ability. Uh, but the overview, we'll talk about sources of authority, where it comes from, uh, how land use law works, a little bit about its history, and then I think we'll take a uh, a pause and have some questions and discussion. And then I want to delve into some specific topics that are important in case law and particularly constitutional law and how that relates to land use law, First Amendment, Fifth Amendment, um, those kinds of issues. Um, then we'll spend a little bit of time on some special topics like federal regulation uh, that affects land use uh, and maybe some of the specific issues like uh, climate and um, nature-friendly uh, land use ordinances or, or land making. So that's where, we'll, that's where we'll go. So sources of authority, so where does land use law authority in the, in the U.S. come from? Does anybody want to throw out a, a venture? Does it derive from the federal constitution? Mostly no. That was Sort of trick question. Most of our land use law derives from the powers of the state governments. Um, it's it's a, uh, the inherent sovereignty of the state governments as typically re-expressed in their state constitution, but it comes from their power to um, the known as the police power, uh, and the police power is to provide for the public health, safety, and general welfare. And sometimes morals is added to that list of police power purposes, particularly in the early expression of that. So land use law derives primarily from the, the powers of the states to provide for protection of public health, safety, welfare, and morals. Um, and those uh, powers uh, are held by the state government. They are not of themselves uh, inherent in local governments. Under the U.S. system, local governments are creatures of the state. So if a local government asserts authority to engage in land use regulation, your first question is, did they get that authority from the state? Is this encompassed in the authority that the state 
government uh, has given them. And every state has provided in some respect or other for local land use uh, regulation. Um, but if there's a quarrel between a property owner, I want to use my property in a particular way, the city or the town or the village or the county says, no, you can't, or you can only do it with these conditions. Um, one of the fundamental questions is, is what the local government is trying to do within the powers that has been granted by the state. Now, the states have tended to grant these powers in various ways, and I'll talk about some standard ways that they do it. But um, the grants of power can be either very broad or very limited. And in the land use parlance, that is treated um, in a set of categories that is known as home rule, which is the, the broadest version. Um, we grant the state by statute, or sometimes state constitution, says um, certain kinds of municipalities have home rule power, and the home rule power encompasses a very broad swath of authority. They don't need to go back to the state to do this. Once they've got their home rule charter or their home rule authority, they can do all kinds of things um, to provide for the health, safety, welfare, and, and morals in regulating land use. The other end of that spectrum is something known as Dillon's Rule, named after a judge who wrote a treatise in the late 18, uh, 1880s, um, um, which expressed the notion that the state, and the truism in a way that uh, local governments can exercise only those powers expressly granted to them by the state, expressly granted to them by the state, uh, or necessarily implied by the powers that are expressly granted. So the Dillon Rule states, essentially, you have to have an express grant of authority, or if you're going beyond that, uh, the authority you're asserting as a local government has to be implied by the express power that you have. Now, nobody really knows how many Dillon Rule states there are. Everybody that has tried to count them has ended up with a different number because in some respects, all the states are or have started out as Dillon Rule states. And the real question is how assiduous have the courts and legislatures been in enforcing that? Um, um, probably one of the strongest examples we have is across the river here in Virginia. Virginia is a Dillon Rule state. And uh, if you as a local government want to do anything about affordable housing, you can't do it without going back to the Virginia General Assembly and getting that authority. That's not a, implied in any way. A number of years ago, there was an issue on changing the payday of, of uh, county officials, and the counties that were concerned had to go to the General Assembly in order to change payday. That's Dillon's rule um, writ very, and interpreted very strictly. There are a lot of Dillon's Rule states that I would classify as closer to the home rule end of the spectrum. In, in fact, you have general authority to provide for transportation improvements and financing of those things. And the question is to how specific that grant of authority in some states, um, the, the courts have said, um, Dillon's rule satisfied if you have authority to finance public improvements. So I don't want you to put too fine a point on this, but you will hear as you if you work in this field those two um, ends of ends of things. And it's really as many things in life and, and law. It's it's kind of a spectrum that uh, practice you know leads us to say uh, you know home, home rule Dillon's rule. Uh, the question is just how much authority has the state granted? And you're always looking for a grant at some level. Uh, many of the states that recognize home rule will recognize it for certain kinds of municipalities and not others. So again, you know, Maryland has home rule counties or, or charter counties. Uh, Pennsylvania, which you know rare, has very few home rule, has a few home rule. And it, it set up a procedure where you can become uh, home rule. Um, in most instances, counties and municipalities have not chosen to do so because it doesn't give them any extra powers. 
because you know that's kind of a soft Dillon's rule in, in Pennsylvania. So anyway, those are the those are the frames in which the local governments are exercising these powers. So how do they exercise these powers? I you know I live in a residential neighborhood, Arlington County. What happens if I want to put up a 7-Eleven on my property, or I'll just put a sign out front. All right, maybe not a 7-Eleven because I need a franchise. I want Jim's convenience store on my residential street. I'm going to sell this, uh, these things out of, out of my uh, door. I would expect my local government to come down on me on that. Why? Well, because I'm violating the zoning of my property, and the zoning has uh, denominated the property that I own as being in a residential district. And the residential district specifies certain uses, certain building configurations, how much lot can I cover, um, what are the setbacks that, that I have to have, what if any signage can I have, I can put a political sign in my front yard, I probably can't put a, you know, a 10 by 10 foot billboard in my front yard uh, saying, you know, come on in for some, some sandwiches or anything of the sort. And that's because the zoning uh, ordinance that, that's been adopted by my local government prohibits me from doing that. So zoning was the primary development of land use regulation that we, we all live by now. It, it developed a uh, primarily at the beginning of the 20th century. And zoning basically took the view that certain uses are appropriate in certain places. And so we're going to separate uses. We'll have residential, we'll have commercial, we'll have industrial, and then we'll define certain subcategories within those, and then we'll define um, procedures within each of those. And that reflected kind of the, a scientific progressive movement uh, of the time on how we're going to understand what's happening to our society where before pretty much what you wanted to do, you could do as long as you owned the land and that you didn't cause a nuisance to your neighbor. And nuisances were generally very strictly um, construed. You weren't polluting their well. You weren't making their air completely unbreathable. Um, you weren't diverting streams that uh, they were counting on for uh, drinking water. You weren't raising a thousand hogs uh, next to their home. You could probably raise five hogs next to their home. But, but zoning said basically, no, we're going to be scientific about this. We're going to say, this is what this area is for. This is what this other area is for. Um, and, and this will all follow a, a plan, and by separating these uses, we're going to design the places of the future. And the places that these, this developed, as you would expect, were urban areas, cities, or emerging cities. You know, rural areas, lots of land, um, these conflicts were not arising. And so the mental model in, within which zoning developed was that of the city or the small city. Uh, as we've learned, um, land use conflicts occur in all kinds of places, and the concerns arise in a lot of places. And so starting with a, a tool which was designed with cities in mind and urban areas in mind, it's been adapted, and we've had to adapt it in many ways over the ensuing century um, to address a lot of other kinds of places or environments. We've also learned that um, zoning has had some um, downsides or perhaps consequences that haven't been ideal. Some of the vitality of, of communities, uh, including 19th century cities, was the mix of uses, not the strict segregation of or, uh, uh, industrial use from commercial use from where people lived. It's great if people can walk to their workplace, for example. It helps with design and transportation. Um, zoning has evolved, so now we have mixed-use districts of various kinds. So your district may actually allow for uh, certain kinds of commercial uh, together with residential, or certain kinds of industrial activities. And we've 
proliferated zoning categories. And some have suggested, you know, blowing up these categories all, all together um, and trying to deal with land use in a different way. But the legacy is primarily built on one of separation of, of uses. And remember when I said that these local government powers are derived from state delegations of power. What's important is that starting primarily with the 1920s, the state delegations of authority pretty much all took the same approach. They took the approach of relying on zoning as the major tool. And one of the things that developed or that led to that uh, uh, remarkable uniformity among the states uh, was the search for how do we write state enabling laws that allow all these cities, townships, and municipalities to deal with land use. We need a model. And um, groups of lawyers and planners got together and developed some model legislation. And one of the places that the model legislation achieved its uh, highest level of development was an effort led by the Commerce Department, the U.S. government, Commerce Department, in the 1920s. Now, we're talking about the 1920s, the Roaring Twenties. World War I is over. There's this opportunity. There's this vitality. Things are happening. People are opening new businesses. There's a sense of prosperity. There's the return to normalcy. You know, what happens in the Harding administration? Um, you know, does the federal government have anything to do with land use? Well, historically, no. The federal government has understood itself as a government of limited powers, and local land use regulation is not one of them. So can the federal government help the states? Yes, they can convene groups of experts and write model legislation. Well, who does that? Well, it's not EPA. EPA doesn't exist for another 50 years. There's no NOAA. Um, the Interior Department exists, but it's mostly managing lands in the, in the West. Um, the Department of uh, War, the War Department, not a good place to look at. Where do you put Commerce Department? Led by an energetic mining engineer who'd had a great career running logistics for the federal government during World War I, a fellow by the name of Herbert Hoover who later became president. So Hoover's Commerce Department gets the experts together and they develop um, what becomes the Standard Zoning Enabling Act. And if you look at any state enabling act for land use today, you will find large parts of it are based on these 1920, this 1920 model legislation. And um, there was no power of the federal government to force anyone to adopt it. There was no care even, you know, we'll give you highway money if you adopt it, because they weren't giving out highway money at the, at the time. Um, um, it was essentially the force of a strong idea and the authority of here's a place that we can look. That act basically uh, tied zone, uh, a dot, said zoning is the way to go, so you define districts. You define the uses that are allowed in districts. You define the shape and density, intensity of use in those districts. You base the, the land use power on the public health, safety, and general welfare. And you'll find that in, in every one of the state enabling acts that you look at today. Um, now, and it set up a set of uh, processes or procedures for adoption of processes that are appropriate for adoption of zoning. One of the things it said was that zoning is adopted after sets of hearings, and uh, it's adopted to be in accordance with a comprehensive plan. And that's all it said about a comprehensive plan. Well, no one knew what a comprehensive plan was. There was kind of the assumption as well. You would plan what your community looked like and then adopt zoning to fit it, and they were responding to the need for model zoning enabling. Um, it turned out uh, people said, well, what's a comprehensive plan and what do we need to do it? So a couple of years later, they went back and wrote something that became known as the Standard City Planning Enabling Act. 
So these were issued in draft or, or informal form in the early 20s, but the published versions were 1924 for the, the Zoning Enabling Act, 28, 27, 28 for the Planning Act. So historically, we have zoning before planning, which seems odd since the zoning has to be in conformance with or in accordance with a comprehensive plan. One of the things that also may lead to confusion from time to time is, is it a comprehensive plan or is it a master plan? If you grew up in California, it's a master plan. Everyone calls it a master plan. In many eastern jurisdictions, it's called a comprehensive plan. It's the same thing. It's just in the Zoning Enabling Model Act, they use the word comprehensive. In the Planning Act, they use master plan. It's the same thing. So here are these influential acts. They're adopted by state governments one by one across the country with modifications in every state. They've been amended year after year, decade after decade. But this is the essential skeleton on which we hang almost all of the powers we've come to know and love in the cities and townships and boroughs and, and counties that, that we live in. So the, the model, and I've done this in a historical approach because I, I think um, thinking about why things got to be where they are helps us understand those things. I, I adhere to Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes um, aphorism that the life of the law is not logic but experience and so that by understanding the history we can understand. Now I'm going to give you at least a version of the logic. If you were learning this or if I were presenting in a more um, Platonistic way, I suppose I would start with the first thing you do way up at the top is you engage in development of a comprehensive plan. That guides everything that follows. And in fact, that's how we do it. So you have to, you can't zone unless you have a comprehensive plan under any of these, or master plan under any of these systems. So you develop a comprehensive plan. And it says, what should our community look like as it grows and changes into the future? You know, where should our transportation corridors be? What do we want to protect in terms of water resources? Um, what are we setting aside or thinking about in terms of parks, schools, uh, public services? Um, what kinds of uh, community development do we want to have? Do we want to have multifamily housing, single family housing? Uh, how close should that be to shopping areas? And the like. Comprehensive plan, and that's developed um, through an uh, open listening process and it's adopted legislatively by an enactment of local governing body, the township board of supervisors, the city council, whatever that may, may be, in accordance with procedures and hearing. The zoning then is adopted after that and must be in accordance with or conformance with the comprehensive plan. And the zoning is what actually affects your ability to put up a 7-Eleven on your property or your giant sign in your yard or anything else you may want to do. Zoning is the legal requirement. The plan itself is not a legal constraint on any activity you're doing on your land. It's, it's the plan for how the community develops. Zoning is what is the law. So, um, and sometimes those two get out of sync. You know, you adopt a comprehensive plan and you don't update it for 25 years. But the zoning, you keep changing or rezoning. Someone comes in with a good idea for a, a strip mall or a shopping district. And so municipalities will uh, change or amend zoning and don't always go back and look at the comprehensive plan. Um, and although it has to be in accordance with or in conformance with, and the language will vary, um, Courts, uh, state courts have varied on how strictly they're going to require that relationship between planning and zoning to be maintained. So but the zoning is the law that bites. It's the one that requires you to get the permits or the approvals or um, the inspections or whatever, and it controls whether or not you get your building permit or what else. There is a third level, and that is subdivision ordinance.
And that uh, follows, in effect, follows the zoning. Subdivision really arises out of how do we define, you know, what is property? How do I know I own the piece of land on which my house says? Well, I've got a deed. You know, well, what does the deed say? It says the person that sold it to me claimed they own this property. Where does that go? And we trace this back through history, and in Virginia, it goes back to some land grant that um, one of the British kings gave in the 1600s um, that you know was for a much larger piece of property than the one I own. Um, so what we rely on there is someone has subdivided and recorded in the land records, um, you know, who owned it before the person that claimed to own it next, uh, and that's your title to the property. So there's a record keeping issue. Do I own what I own? How do I know that you don't own it if there's a dispute? And that's all in the title records. Over time, um, there developed, this developed long before zoning even, this um, notion that there needed to be some way of regulating how these large parcels of land were subdivided into small parcels. And we see this today. So a new town, new development, you buy a 500 acre parcel from a farmer, in order to build a housing development, you need to subdivide it into parcels. Um, but there are laws and rules, again, defined by the state, but administered locally under local subdivision ordinances, which say, here's what you, how the terms under which you can subdivide it. No, you can't subdivide this into one-inch parcels. That's, you know, that's prohibited. You know, there are certain minimum lot sizes that a subdivision ordinance will all have. There may also be substantive requirements dealing with things like uh, subdivisions uh, into parcels that have its entirely steep slope, or it's all underwater. And so it turns out that subdivision ordinances contain things like uh, size, conformance, setback, and some environmental and other provisions that deal with subdivision. In some areas, there are only subdivision ordinances. There's no zoning or planning above that because it relates initially to that control over um, how can land be chopped into smaller pieces and kept track of. You know, most places you'll find um, all three, but there are areas of the U.S. that are unzoned, unplanned and unzoned, um, and, but many of those uh, do have uh, at least rules on, on subdivision, even if they're rudimentary rules on subdivision. So my platonic ideal, however, is I've got my comprehensive plan, I've got my zoning ordinance, which is in accordance with or conformance with the comprehensive plan, and it has all kinds of regulations and approvals. And then below that, I have subdivision ordinances, which get really specific as to what size my lot can be um, and how it has to be configured. Does it have to have street frontage? If someone is subdividing, they have a dedication of street and sidewalks. You don't want someone subdividing into parcels that are landlocked that no one can get to because what do you do with police and fire or disputes? You know, I've got to go across three other people's uh, parcel and I have no right of access. So subdivision uh, ordinances are pretty clear. So if you know the key, these key provisions, the local go, the local power derives from state uh, delegation or state enabling law. And the flavors of local um, regulation come in the form of the comprehensive plan, the zoning ordinance, and the subdivision ordinance. You know the skeleton or framework that will enable you to operate anywhere within the confines of the United States with some exceptions, as lawyers will always know their exceptions, dealing with things dealing with federal lands or uh, Native American lands. So, um, to some extent, uh, Hawaiian lands, uh, there will be some distinctions, and there are different flavors of these in different states, but that's the model. I'm going to stop um, right here to see if there are any questions or clarifications from in the room or, uh, or on the webinar uh, before I then dive into some of these more specific kinds of issues.
Yes, sir, please. Uh, if you... Hi, my name is Scott Mitchell. I'm a student at Howard right now. Uh, I'm curious to know at what level can the public become involved and make changes and, and what do they have to do? Yeah, the question, at what level can the public become involved and um, uh, what opportunity do they have to make, uh, to make changes? Um, and what do they do? Um, the enabling acts all provide um, that the public has to be involved for adoption of a comprehensive plan and amendments to the comprehensive plan. Um, so there have to be public hearings uh, and uh, there has to be a proposal and public hearing before the plan is voted on. Uh, if a municipality doesn't do that, it's violated the plan it, it, or violated the enabling law, it has no plan. The plan is invalid. Similar provisions apply at the level of zoning, adoption of zoning and rezoning. So almost anywhere you, you live, you'll find uh, on the web, now it used to be just published in legal notices, um, you know, notices of proposed rezoning of particular parcels. Um, uh, and members of the public have a right to see what the applications are in the zoning proposal and to testify or submit uh, material before that uh, zoning or rezoning is voted on. Um, subdivision uh, tends to be much more a ministerial act um, that, that's carried out in accordance with the, uh, uh, with the ordinance. There are versions of that where uh, instead of uh, simple subdivision uh, that the municipality is approving a site plan approval for development, phase development of an entire site, and site plan approvals typically require similar public uh, hearings of involvement as, uh, as zoning uh, do. So in terms of the legal rights, um, it's always there. In terms of what you're able to get, um, you know, do you get two minutes at the public hearing? or you get the hearing before the Planning Commission, and then you get two minutes uh, before the Planning Commission recommendation goes to the City Council, you get to say something with the City Council. Um, you know, it, it can be fairly, uh, fairly limited in practice, um, but you have the right and they have the obligation to take public comment, including voluminous written um, comments, what the municipality does with that. Uh, is, is kind of up to whether or not uh, they otherwise, their decision conforms to the powers that they, they have. In some states, um, there's a great deal of procedure. In some states, uh, uh, there's also, in California, almost all these activities are subject to environmental impact review under the uh, California Environmental Quality Act. And, that provides uh, much more an involvement for a guarantee of public involvement because there the municipality has to explain how it dealt with all those uh, comments dealing with environmental impacts of a approved change. Under, under other places, their duty to explain, they don't have to deal with every comment, they simply have to make a decision which has heard or received public comment um, and the ultimate decision is in conformance with the powers that they've been granted by the state government. I hope that helps. Other comments or questions at this phase? Yes. I'm Talia Fox. I'm a uh, research associate here at the Environmental Law Institute. Um, I was wondering if you could just elaborate a little bit about how environmental considerations are, are incorporated. I know you were speaking about public comment, but maybe in other ways, um, are scientists involved in, in constructing the comprehensive plan? I, I imagine in some states more than others, but yeah, if you could just speak to that a bit more. Okay. And I could piggyback on that. I was actually going to, I was wondering if um, some states have state NEPAs for comprehensive plans as well, yeah, besides there, California. Yeah, there, there are a few, although California is the one that has integrated the state environmental impact assessment. Uh, process uh, most deeply into local land use planning and, and zoning. Uh, you have uh, 
some level of, of uh, engagement in Washington State and, and New York State into a set of those um, municipal uh, acts and decisions. Um, there are a number of other, there, there are about, uh, about a third of the states have uh, environmental impact assessment laws, but uh, probably fewer than half a dozen that have integrated very seriously into these kinds of decisions. And, and, and California is, is the one that's done it uh, most into uh, the, the, to the level of uh, rezoning, for example, uh, type uh, decision. Uh, get, getting to the broader question of integrating environmental considerations. So all of the lanes planning uh, uh, and zoning enabling acts um, provide a set of elements that local governments are required to include in their comprehensive plan, uh, which they need to do that as a predicate to zoning. Almost all of them include natural resources, uh, water, transportation. There's variability as to how far they get into things that we might think of as sustainability considerations. And most of those, um, there's a set of required elements and a set of optional elements. And so sometimes many of the things that we might think of as environmental are in the optional elements for a comprehensive plan. And they've done that largely because these were added through later legislation and they don't want to burden their smallest municipalities with engaging these uh, kinds of activities. Um, the, the normal practice, and there's a there's a broad set of uh, planners, um, many of whom are members of the American Planning Association, and there's the American uh, Institute of Certified Planners, um, uh, and many others engaged in the preparation of plans. And that typically does require really understanding the natural environment, areas of future growth. Every Planning Zone Enabling Act that I've seen requires uh, a projection of future growth. So you don't want to just plan and zone for who lives there now or what industries are now, but what do we expect or want to have? And so there, there's always reliance on some sort of population uh, projection that's built into the development of a plan. Now we have uh, pretty strong uh, geographic information systems uh, priorities, and some plans uh, are multi-million dollar efforts, years in the making, um, with a great deal of integration of things like, uh, you know, renewable energy or seeing, trying to see in the future for alternative forms of transportation or water demand or, or water use. Some of the intersections that the Environmental Law Institute gets into are, um, you know, how can we uh, help integrate environmental considerations into into these kinds of activities as, as matters of practice, like demand for water or water efficiency. Um, so there are many opportunities to do that. The requirements or the depth to which any municipality will go to is partly a function of what the expectations of its citizens are, you know, how much money it has. So Montgomery County, Maryland, or you know, Arlington uh, County, Virginia here in the in the metro area of Fairfax, um, you know, many of those and other metropolitan areas have those uh, capabilities and the expectations or capacities that they'll, they'll have. It. There are many municipalities in the U.S. that have, you know, four or five hundred <laughs> residents and they're engaged in comprehensive planning and zoning. They may have no full-time employees or staff at all. Um, you know, they'll have a part-time elected council. They might have a, a town clerk. Uh, and if they need these functions, they'll have to, to acquire them by, you know, hiring a, a consulting, typically engineer in the smallest things who will try to provide some kind of off-the-shelf version of this. And so, unless there are resources available to them free or close to free um, from um, some uh, regional organizations, councils of government and the, and the like, their ability to integrate these concerns will be. Yeah, quite another question here, and then we'll move to the next edition. 
Hi, I'm Colin Parts. I'm an intern here at the Environmental Law Institute, Research and Publications intern. Um, I had a question. You talked a lot, or uh, you talked about planning for an expanding population, but I was curious when you had like a declining population in a city like Detroit or something like that, and how you account in planning as well, because I know there are like a lot of urban farms and things like that going into what were formerly residential areas that have had houses torn down. Right. Yes, you, um, you in fact do need to, to plan and, and zone for um, declines in po population. And we, there's this whole uh, issue of shrinking cities or vacant uh, vacant properties with uh, a redevelopment of brownfields, urban farming, as you uh, properly point out. Um, one of the interesting things is I think that the original development of of these early zone planning and zoning is kind of the expectation is that growth would just continue and it, it had this mental model that of course cities was where everyone would be uh, and the areas further out wouldn't even plan or zone unless they were growing and so there was this not an expectation of this sort of level of decline or urban uh, abandonment that we come to see largely as a post-World War II uh, function. So the, the kind of models and the laws and when these were uh, adopted is problematic. The other thing that's a little bit problematic is that cities which are losing population are also losing tax base and so their capacity to devote uh, funds to planning and adopting rezoning for these things in place of spending the money on providing fire services where there are many abandoned buildings or garbage collection or other municipal services puts a strain on these things. But the fact is, um, yes, uh, and particularly the, the well-known urban examples, uh, many of them have engaged in development of amendments to their comprehensive plan or development of um, amendments that deal with particular areas of the city or urbanizing area. Sector plans, uh, for example, uh, you know, Baltimore is engaged in a, uh, the, this kind of effort uh, currently. Um, and, and you really do need to amend the plan so that it can accommodate these kinds of uses, even if they're temporary uses, you know, urban farming for a time until a period of time when you hope people will find it attractive enough to redevelop or re-urbanize. Uh, uh, you know, how do you provide for gentrification and, and abandonment in the same city? These things sometimes are uh, things that you deal with. So, yeah, good, good set of issues uh, and a rich set of issues indeed. All right, I'm going to pause the questioning for the moment and talk about some of the content of the, the zoning and, and procedures and so forth. Uh, we talked a little bit about procedures. All these things have procedures. All the procedures have to comply with due process of law, which has guaranteed us uh, under the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. So we can't have uh, takings of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. That applies to things like zoning uh, and other forms of regulation. And Due process of law includes procedures, uh, first and, and foremost. Um, and those due process guarantees, 14th Amendment applies to actions of the state, and uh, the local governments acting as creatures of the state or agents of the state are also bound by due process guarantees. So if it's kind of like your council decides to you know, prohibit your current land use or your or deny your rezoning because um, uh, they don't like you or uh, you know they have a personal feud or uh, they uh, engage in it without a quorum. You know, one person uh, purports to enact an ordinance because you know, you know, you shot my dog last week and, and therefore all of your things are, are denied and I do this without public notice and I've only got two voting members of a board of seven you know, that violates not only the State Enabling Act, and the but it also is a due process violation. So we have, uh, in some respects, federal guarantees, um, and that also means that we might have not just state 
uh, remedies, you know, appeal to a state, uh, to the, like a zoning commission locally, and then from there to the state uh, uh, courts up through the state. Uh, you know, did you follow the, the state enabling laws in the state constitution? I may also have the ability, and I do, um, have the ability to pursue federal violations if there are federal violations. Due process of law may be one of those. And I may have even a choice of law as to am I pursuing my federal claims and state claims together in state court or my federal claims in federal court together with lawyers, you know, pendant state claims where you're able to, uh, to do that. So you are entitled to, to review of these various decisions, and there are various procedures. Um, the important thing to keep in mind is that most of the things that we'll be dealing with are interpretations of local and state law, and therefore the review will go up through this, whatever state um, remedy there is. It may be administrative in the first instance, a uh, appeal zoning commission at the, at the local level, and from then to the to the local district court or court of common pleas or whatever the name of your court of lowest uh, origin, uh, original jurisdiction may be. And then the end of the line is the state Supreme Court. The state Supreme Court has the final say on is this in conformance with state law? Uh, did the local government do what it was allowed to do uh, or, or not, or did, did they not? including state constitutional law, which includes various guarantees of speech and um, guarantees of liberty and due process that are not exactly the same as the federal. But if you've gone up through the state court systems, your state claims you're done. Once you lose at the state, the state Supreme Court is the final arbiter of, the, uh, of what state law and the state constitution mean. You may have an appeal from the state Supreme Court, highest court, it goes by different names, to the U.S. Supreme Court, and I'll talk about a few of those cases, where you have preserved or litigated a federal claim, like a claim of, of takings of property uh, without just compensation, where you've pursued that through the state courts, and the one remaining issue is, you know, I'll go from the highest court with my one remaining federal constitutional issue, I can go from the highest state court to the U.S. Supreme Court if they will take my case. Um, you may see it there. The other avenue is if you're pursuing a federal claim, most of these are things like First Amendment claim. I've been denied uh, uh, the, the right to uh, free exercise of religion, or I've been denied my First Amendment right to put up uh, my sign saying, you know, stop the war or impeach the president or whatever it may be. Um, I, I may not choose to pursue those through my state court remedies. I may file in the federal district court for the district where the, the property is located. And <laughs> pursue that up through the federal system, um, pursuing my federal constitution or in some cases federal statutory uh, claim. Uh, and, and there, the, those decisions, because they're federal law, uh, uh, the final word is wherever my review stops in the federal court system, court of appeals, uh, and again, Supreme Court, if they choose to take the decision. Sometimes there's mixed questions, federal and state, and if you go up through the federal court, the federal court may um, decide that there, it really turns on interpretation of state law and their procedures where they can act, ask state Supreme Courts for opinions on how an issue might come out under state law. This is a very complex legal issue that I don't want to get into. But what I do want to get into is um, if you're reading a, a court case on land use, first thing to do is look at, am I in federal court or state court? If I'm in federal court, there has to be, a, or if the case is in federal court, there has to be a federal issue. And so you want to understand what that claim is about. If you're in state court, it might be either a state claim or a federal claim. Um, and, and you'll want to understand what, what that's about. I want to say a, a few things about um, kind of uh, zoning, what it tends to allow or how it deals with uses. One of the things is uh, all zoning ordinances are adopted in a context where there are already people owning and using land. Right? We never zone for uh, a municipality where there is no one. 
Um, and so the question is, and, and you're obliged under the Zoning Enabling Acts to zone for the entire municipality. So if I'm a municipality, I can't say, oh, all you people that are already living there, I'm not adopting zoning for you. I'm only going to adopt it for, you know, one small area of land. I have to adopt it in accordance with the comprehensive plan for the entire municipality. So what do I do with existing uh, buildings and uses? There is a doctrine called non-conforming uses. So if I have an area and you're, you're operating a um, grocery store or a manufacturing plant, but my comprehensive plan and zoning calls for it, you know, I really want this to be my vibrant downtown you know, apartment district with um, you know, destination retail or whatever, um, what do I do? What happens to the, to the industrial use? What happens is the industrial use is treated as a non-conforming use. And as long as that use is continued in the same way as at the time of the adoption of the zoning ordinance, it can continue even though it is not conforming to the zoning ordinance. What happens with non-conforming uses is um, if those uses are uh, abandoned or curtailed by the property owner or user, um, then the next user can't restart a non-conforming use, or you can't put a new non-conforming use on an existing non-conforming use. So, you know, in interesting respects, non-conforming uses have, in a way, um, provided an opportunity for us to see uh, the vitality of mixed use. So some areas, older cities were zoned entirely residential, but non-conforming uses were mom and pop retail. Um, well, it turns out, oh yeah, having mom and pop, uh, mom and pop, uh, you know, retail uh, grocery or you know, bodega or hardware store actually provides vitality. So we've learned something from this history of non-conforming uses. But non-conforming uses are disfavored. So if it if it, um, you know, you abandon it for a, a period of time, you know, you close up shop, you can't restart it. Uh, and there are various legal tests under what constitutes abandonment of a non-conforming use. There are also all kinds of issues on, you know, what happens if there's a fire or partial destruction of the property? Are you allowed to rebuild? General rule is yes, but there are many exceptions and measures to that. There are also um, state laws that provide for and allow phase out of non-conforming uses with an amortization, that is, some opportunity to realize the economic value with a many-year, multi-year phase out of the non-conforming use. Those, those tend to get litigated, very hotly contested. But non-conforming uses are important. The other important thing is with the zoning having set up things, you, Generally, you know what you get going in. So you have certain uses by right. So I buy, I buy a lot in a residential neighborhood. The lot conforms to the lot dimensions and setbacks. I can get a building permit to put up my house on that. It's a by right use. If I buy these properties and I want to do something different or innovative, I, I may need to have the area rezoned. Uh, I may seek a site plan approval if that's allowed for kind of an integrated approach where I'm going to put up housing on some and apartments on others and, you know, cluster development or whatever. Again, that requires an action or approval by the local government. There may also be uses that are conditional uses or um, special exceptions. So um, something might be residential, but we allow certain things like uh, um, teaching music lessons or doing seasonal tax preparation as a home-based business. Uh, the zoning ordinance could write that in as an as-of-right use, or uh, it may write it in as a conditional use. You know, yes, you can do it on condition that you don't have, uh, you know, 100 cars a day, you know, parking on the street, or that noise levels are within certain <laughs> activities. Um, and there's a very rich law dealing with the extent to which conditional uses, um, uh, what kind of review or approval. Is it strictly administrative, uh, or is it a process that requires a greater level of review or even a legislative level of review, uh, including categories of use that are 
called. And these all have different names in different places, special exceptions. Um, but again, these are uh, where you're doing something that uh, that may be uh, uh, different from the as of right use that I initially uh, described. Um, there are also issues where, you know, when you write a zoning ordinance uh, pretty broadly, you've, you've got a mental model of what these are like, um, but it just doesn't, it doesn't work on the particular site. And that can get you into the issue of variances. You know, can, do you need a variance? So but the issue may be you require a certain setback distance from, you know, each of the adjoining parcels. And in fact, um, unfortunately, because uh, it was adopted after the actual subdivision had occurred or something had changed, um, you can't you can't manage the setback because your lot is not square. You know, you have frontage on three sides uh, of of the lot, or there's an extremely steep slope where there's no nowhere to put the garage or whatever the use may be, and so. All zoning ordinances provide for some form of variance um, where you can go in and the test is generally one of undue hardship. So if you can show that the zoning regulation affects what it is that you want to do is causing an undue hardship, um, you may be entitled to a variance. The variance, uh, the availability of variances, although almost every state uses an undue hardship standard Undue hardship can mean you have no possible use of the property and not, you know, you can barely even pitch a tent on it and anything else is not undue hardship. So unless it's a complete utter taking of the property, you don't get it. To, oh, looks like an undue hardship good enough for me, um, you know, as long as the local um, governing authority grants it, that's okay. So consult your local um, uh, your local case law, and particularly, uh, you know, if you're engaged in this, your your local uh, uh, planning and zoning um, professionals on whether or not a variance is available. And sometimes these things can can change o over time. Um, uh, so um, there's also a question of whether your state allows uh, variances for uses or just for these dimensional issues. You know, do I have somewhere to site my building because of setback, that's an old steep slope, that's a dimensional issue, or, you know, can I get a variance for a use? You know, some level of mom pop retail is, is desirable and doesn't bother the neighbors uh, because, you know, uh, of the adjoining uses are, are okay. In many places that's not legal, in some states it is legal, so. Variances come in various flavors, um, but you'll you'll always find dimensional variances uh, somewhere. So I um, again, I, I'm kind of talking about by right and things that are um, you know non-conforming uses by right of limitations. Conditional use is is a flavor of by right, but the conditions are spelled out in the ordinance. Um, it's just that these uh, things may uh, change your ability to do the kinds of things that you want to do with land. Now, zoning can also apply um, things that are different from just straight uses. So in the environmental field, we have an issue of something called an overlay zone. So you have the underlying zoning. My zoning may say, this area is residential. The area next to it is light. Um, commercial. Um, and then you know, I've learned over time that this is really the water charge uh, or the water recharge area for my, uh, my area, or it's particularly important for runoff to a local stream or wetland. Um, uh, the municipality can adopt an overlay zone, so it doesn't change the underlying requirements for how big my house can be or what the setback is. And it doesn't change, you know, is this residential or commercial, but it imposes an overlay or additional set of requirements. So it may be that when I am constructing or reconstructing my uh, light commercial um, 
business, I'm in conformance with the commercial zoning, but I might be required by the overlay zone to install impervious pavement, pavement you know, to help with a water recharge. Or uh, I might have various uh, uh, changes in lighting or access uh, requirements that might deal with uh, habitat or other concerns that I have. So, um, you know, zoning has developed um, through use of things like overlay zones um, uh, and other tools that, to accommodate some of these other kinds of uses. I, I want to um, now turn for a, a short while to uh, takings law. Um, one of the things that always arises uh, in a conflict, someone wants to make a use of a property, and there might be conflict with the neighbors, there might be conflict with what the municipality says you want to do. And one of the questions is if the municipality imposes conditions or limitations, is that a taking of my property without just compensation in violation of the 14th Amendment applying the Fifth Amendment? Um, um, the initial claim was that zoning itself uh, is a taking because it, it uh, limits uh, these uh, uses of property, which were formerly pretty free to be willy-nilly where and how the property owner wanted, as long as it wasn't a nuisance. In 1926, in the very famous case of Village of Euclid versus Ambler Realty, the uh, U.S. Supreme Court uh, upheld what is still, I think, a very uh, sophisticated and complex zoning arts when you consider how long ago it was adopted, uh, specifying building envelopes and setbacks and districts and use uh, districts and the like. Um, uh, they, they upheld that uh, as not a violation of the federal constitution. And for the most part, um, uh, Euclid, uh, is, is the touchstone case uh, today. So what we tend to get into is you know, much more specific limitations or prohibitions uh, that have arisen in the uh, context of regulatory takings. Um, that the kind of key decisions are the also 1920s decision, Pennsylvania Coal, U.S. Supreme Court, with the aphorism, if a regulation goes too far, it may be found to be a regulatory taking. And of course, we've litigated over since what goes too far. Uh, most land use cases end up applying what is known as the Penn Central balancing test from a 1970s Supreme Court decision. Um, and if you look up the Penn Central decision, um, the uh, that uh, very firmly states the law that is, is applied today. Um, and the, the factors that are considered are the economic impact of the uh, action or limitation imposed by the local government, uh, the extent to which it interferes with the property owner's distinct investment-backed expectations, distinct investment-backed expectations of the property owner. So the Fifth Amendment, Fourteenth Amendment, do not protect speculative uses um, if you're claiming you suffer an economic impact or loss. Um, it's got to be distinct and investment backed. So, um, and there are, there are tests for determining that. The court will also consider the character of the governmental action. You know, does this look kind of like government uh, engaged in a land grab? You know, trying to create a park at private expense, or is this engaged in benefiting the public health, safety, and welfare in a way that looks more like traditional governmental regulation? And this is kind of a sliding scale, but those elements of the, of the economic impact, distinct investment-backed government, uh, uh, or sorry, distinct investment-backed expectations and character of the governmental action really constitute the Penn Central elements. And if the local government has done its homework, most of those cases will be resolved in favor of upholding what it is that the governmental action is engaged in. Some will not, but, but many of them are. There's a, a, another line of cases um, uh, named after uh, Lucas versus uh, South Carolina uh, 
Conservation or Coastal Council uh, a, a case in the 1990s, which in which the Supreme Court said, uh, if there is a total wipeout of economic value of the property, um, in general that will be upheld, will be held to be a regulatory taking unless the governmental action uh, does no more than restate or embody background principles of one nuisance or to property law. So if you're if you're prohibiting a uh, a nuclear power plant from being built on an earthquake fault, uh, even though you may wipe out all value of the property, uh, Lucas doesn't help you because in effect the prohibition is carrying out things that we would have thought of as, as uh, prohibited by nuisance, causing a nuisance to your neighbors by killing them all the next time an earthquake um, comes along. An extreme example, but I use it because it was it was cited by the justices in, in um, discussing uh, those those cases. So, um, you know, many years ago I wrote an article collecting other kinds of background principles of property law, and, and there are many of them particularly dealing with actions in the coastal zone and water, um, but there are other types of background principles that might um, uh, uphold hold the governmental action even in a, a Lucas type setting. One of the questions that constantly comes up then in, you know, is this a taking? And of course, if the property owner didn't get what they want from the local government, they want to say it's a taking because that gives them leverage to, to get a better decision from the local government. Local government wants to say, hey, we're just looking out for our citizens. That's not a taking. Um, so one of the questions is, so do we apply the Penn Central balancing test in which the government generally wins, or do we want to apply the Lucas test in which the property owner generally wins? And since Lucas says we need a uh, essentially a total wipeout of economic value, um, What's kind of important is, you know, so what is the totality of which uh, is being wiped out? So, you know, here's a question. So, <clears throat> I, I bought a 100-acre farm and I developed 90 acres of it. Um, and um, I've got the 10 remaining acres and I haven't gotten to those 10 remaining acres because they've got bald eagle nests and, you know, wetlands and, uh, uh, you know, various other kinds of uh, things on them. But I apply now to the local government for development on my 10 acres, and the local government says, no, you violate our steep slope ordinance, our wetlands ordinance, and you know, you probably got trouble with the Fish and Wildlife Service and deny. So I could say, I'm in, the, I'm in the Lucas analysis because you have denied me any economic value of my 10 acre parcel which is the only thing in front of you, and it's the only thing I have applied for. Is that the totality? Or does local government look more broadly, hey, you know, you've had the benefit of, of you know, you've developed 90% of this entire, uh, you know, unified development. You can't cherry pick in order to experience it. So wipe out, we should apply, you know, Penn Central. And, and it's a question of fact, as well as law, as to, to what applies. And it gets more complex when it's not the same owner, but it's someone, you know, in a successive chain of title uh, that gets that 10 acres that, that they developed. Or if these parcels are part of a common development scheme, but they're not all adjacent to one another scattered throughout the jurisdiction. You know, the question is, um, what applies. And I, I can't answer that for you, I'm not going to answer it for you, but um, in general, uh, this has become known as the uh, denominator problem uh, in the fraction of have you lost, you know, 100% of 100% or 10% of 100%. And, um, and it, it's also known as uh, the parcel as a whole uh, problem. So we can leave that for a takings law uh, 
uh, summer school or, or other thing if, if you want to do a very rich uh, kind of set of issues. The other uh, area in which uh, takings law arises in is in the area of exactions. Uh, exactions are dedications or conditions, uh, uh, and, and it arose in the Supreme Court in terms of required dedications of land that the local government or the state government requires in exchange for approving uh, an action. So yes, you can develop your coastal parcel as long as you provide an easement allowing public access. Um, yes, you can um, redevelop a parking lot on a floodplain as long as you provide dedication of a greenway to provide for the transportation needs and to control runoff. Um, and a pair of cases uh, known euphoniously as the Nolan, N-O-L-L-A-N, and Dolan, D-O-L-A-N, case the Supreme Court has articulated what um, those rules are. And essentially, if the local government or state government is imposing an exaction, um, and, and we know it applies to all exactions of real property, and it's still a little bit up for grabs in terms of other conditions like payment of money. But um, if, if that's the condition that's being opposed, the local government has to meet the test of that the exaction has to have an essential nexus to the act activity that's being approved or the impact of the activity that's being approved. So there may be an essential nexus to your paving more parking lot, there might be a nexus to providing more greenery or we're allowing more, we're going to generate more traffic, maybe providing uh, access by footpath or bike path might have an essential nexus. It's a fact kind of inquiry. Um, and then the question is, is the exaction, does it bear rough proportionality to the impact? So two-part test, essential nexus, can't be entirely unrelated to, you know, we're going to approve this, uh, but only if, if uh, you give us uh, some completely unrelated uh, dedication of land, uh, you know, over here, and a rough proportionality. So you're not paying for the entire convention center for the, in exchange for, you know, putting up an addition to your convenience store, um, an extreme example to be sure. Um, uh, is the constitutional test. And there are many then disputes or quarrels under what these things are. There are many instances under which uh, local government under state law um, requires the payment of impact fees, if allowed under state law, to pay for it. impacts of more people pay for schools or roads. Uh, many states will, will allow local governments to impose those fees. And most of those have not run afoul of this um, test. The usual legal challenge is, is it in conformance with the state enabling law? And then other kinds of conditions in exchange. Yes, we'll give you additional four floors of density if you provide access to the state park, or access to parkland to the general public, or uh, you'll install public art, or streetscape, or benches, or the like. Those kinds of negotiated um, conditions um, uh, occur all the time in, in every state. And state law varies greatly as to what those are called and as to how voluntary they are regarded uh, or as to whether they're regarded much more like what the Supreme Court said was a, a exaction. So I'm going to um, leave that there. Um, yeah, why don't I stop there, because that whole set of takings issue is probably its own set, and then I'm going to turn to sort of a last set of issues uh, dealing with things like uh, First Amendment, uh, uh, environmental issues, uh, hydraulic fracturing, you know, all kinds of like uh, fun and hot current issues in land use law. Any questions on the land use? Uh, yeah, uh, you in the early row and then the gentleman behind. I wondered if you'll have a chance to get to uh, some of the issues in transferable development rights. <laughs> I was going to pass by transferable oh, development rights because that's a very uh, 
interesting and complex issue of its own. But I will say this, that among the many land use tools that have been developed and, and pioneered to some extent locally here, um, uh, Montgomery County, but also in New Jersey, starting with the Pine Lands and Long Island, uh, Pine Barrens, but used in many other places is the idea of transfer of development rights. And the idea here is that uh, if the municipality, and typically it's or authority, uh, that has regulation over land use is going to limit the ability to um, develop parcels in some way that will economically impinge on uh, the landowners, typically rural landowners. Um, they'd like to provide some way for them to achieve some economic value from the property. One of the ways of doing it is to assign a set of development rights to that conservation area. So locally, Montgomery County has an agricultural conservation area in the western part of the county um, uh, to, to which transferable development rights attach. And development in other areas of the county uh, is allowed but can be even more dense if uh, the developers acquire or purchase the development rights from the holders that are in the conservation area. So it a, provides a way to achieve more intensity or density of use uh, in an area where it's allowed while providing some economic recovery to those in the conservation zone. There are many, many flavors of these. They have to be authorized by state law, either directly or under a home rule grant of, uh, of authority. But uh, a, a, great, um, a great tool, not available in all states because not all states recognize transfer of development rights. Um, I hope that's enough for the moment, or do you have a specific? Well, I just wondered if you had, I just wondered if you had any uh, particularly good models you wanted to mention. Um, I, I don't, but I would be happy to talk with you after the fact. And there are many models in, um, in a number of the many books I've held up and referred to. Um, there, there are many, um, but I don't want to single any out here, but, um, given the time that we have. Uh, yeah, who else? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Hi, uh, Spencer Gall. I'm a law clerk here at ELI. With respect to non-conforming uses, typically what's the rule regarding whether or not the use can continue after the property or, you know, whatever the ownership is changes? So, for instance, if I own a bodega that's a non-conforming use and I sell it, can the purchaser continue to operate the store? Yeah, and again, I'm speaking generally because this varies by state law. I and mean, in general, the non-conforming use can, can attach to the new owner as long as there's not a change in the use. If there's a hiatus in the use, you sell the property and quit running it, and they don't get around to it until the right period of time. Um, that can sever the conforming use. Yeah, But um, there are lots of exceptions, but that's the point. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to uh, turn to this, uh, what, what I think is uh, last set of issues, and then maybe we can have some general discussion in the time that, uh, that remains uh, to us. Uh, among the, the hot recurring issues that I have not really alluded to in any great uh, degree are uh, issues of uh, First Amendment expression. And the First Amendment uh, can raise all kinds of issues with respect to uh, the land use law. Uh, signage is one big area of law, and um, the Supreme Court has uh, opinions on this that provide some guidance, although it's um, not always easy to interpret. Um, in general, time, place, and manner regulations of, of signage and expression are allowed, um, uh, but one needs to be really careful in regulating uh, signage and expression, particularly to attach it to uh, public health, safety, and general welfare. So there's a lot of issue over how big or distracting the signs can be. You know, our driver's going to drive off the road because they're flashing lights or dancing um, bears or whatever you may want. Um, and then the content issue, uh, First Amendment law, uh, really frowns on regulating on the basis of content, but it gets into very difficult issues. Can you regulate on the basis of 
you know, okay, you can have a sign on your building that tells you the name tells the name of the building. You know, to what extent can you uh, substitute the sign of the same size that says "I hate the mayor" or whatever the, those things may be? And this turns out to be a very complex uh, and uh, freely litigated areas of law. The ban of billboards or new billboards or decommissioning of billboards uh, is an issue also uh, fraught with a great, uh, great deal of litigation. But um, time, place, and manner is the touchstone uh, that one would um, generally look to and to the, to the writ to, for valid ordinance and uh, attempting to allow pl some place for political speech. So you, you can't be wider open to, you know, buy mattresses 40% uh, off uh, and not allow, um, you know, stop the drones or, um, you know, reelect Smith or whatever the, those kinds of things. Uh, but but it's, it's a fraud issue, so I, I'm not able to say a great deal about this. The other is the issue of um, religious expression and construction of um, an operation of uh, religious or religious affiliated establishments. There are First Amendment protections that go with those. There are issues of whether you're operating a, um, a place of worship and then you throw the doors open to feeding programs or uh, homeless uh, shelter or people sleeping on the steps or uh, distribution of uh, food, all sorts of issues that relate to those. To what extent, you know, can the local government, you know, that I require you to get a certificate of occupancy? Or can they limit, you know, you have 500 people living there. Well, they have nowhere else to go. Is, is that um, a, a protected uh, activity under the First Amendment, or is that within the local government's provision for public health, safety, and welfare? And there are many decisions and clashes that, as you would imagine, relate to that. And then, uh, you know, to what extent are activities related to the protected religious mission or are we have, you know, we're putting up a new um, gymnasium, you know, because it, that's where our youth groups meet and we also have Wednesday night basketball and um, is, is that a First Amendment? protected issue or does it not look like one? And again, a very fraught issue that I don't want to offer uh, opinion on, but it's things to be aware of. Congress uh, got into this issue on, on several occasions. Uh, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which we've uh, heard of in many other contexts, um, you know, uh, uh, with respect to services to uh, gay, lesbian, transgender, and other individuals has come up recently on things that are uh, uh, said to be modeled under uh, the, the federal act. The original federal act uh, ran into problems uh, of constitutionality um, because it went, uh, the Supreme Court said, it went too far in uh, protecting or uh, pre giving preference to religious kinds of activities. And, so Congress enacted a fix in, in uh, year uh, 2000 uh, known as the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, RELUPA. So uh, RELUPA, also a very complex issue, that, and it deals with two issues that got joined at the hip, dealing with the, the religious practices of inmates um, and dealing with local land use regulation of religious activities and those enactments, uh, at least the lower courts have held, are constitutional um, and, and the religious, uh, the land use side is, is still being litigated uh, in many respects even a decade and a half later. Uh, but it basically, uh, on the land use side, it says that local governments uh, land use restrictions uh, 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 that uh, can't, cannot impose a substantial burden on religious exercise. So the initial test is, is it a land use regulation or some other kind of regulation? 
It's not a land use regulation, Root Loop, it doesn't help you. Uh, and is it on religious exercise? Or is it on something else, parking or whatever? Which may, may relate to a religious exercise, but we'll have to see. So you can't, you know, no land use regulation can impose a substantial burden on religious exercise unless um, there's a compelling government interest that's being advanced by the regulation and the government has used the least restrictive means. So all you lawyers, aspiring lawyers and others can see there are many issues of definition that are going to be uh, fact um, specific. But this arises on issues like people trying to cite mosques in communities that aren't used to having mosques. And so is it is this merely, hey, we you know, we're applying our law neutrally, you know, to all kinds of activities, or are we in fact putting a substantial burden on religious exercise under the guise of a land use regulation? And, you know, if we are, if we advance any compelling government interest, well, not if it, particularly if it looks like all kinds of other activities that have parking and activities. Well, what about a noise regulation dealing with you know, call to prayer or whatever this may be. And so, um, you know, the issue is uh, is uh, fraud and often to be litigated, but in the that area we have not only First Amendment protection, but we have statutory issues um, to deal with very interesting, complex um, issues of law. I want to touch on a few others, and there, you probably have others that you would like, prefer to talk about than all the things that I trying to cover in this, this time. Um, one issue is what, what issue should the state reserve to itself because they just don't want local governments uh, going in all different directions. Some of those issues have dealt with issues like mining. You know, do you want 200 or 2,000 local regulation of mining law? Um, recently with hydraulic fracturing for oil and gas, it's come up in in states um, that, you know, can local governments, you know, ban hydraulic fracturing in states that allow hydraulic fracturing as a matter of state law and whose state law says our state oil and gas law preempts all, all local regulation because we don't want, you know, drillers to have to, you know, come up with different things or, or you know, confront takings claims or whatever based on local, local preferences that, you know, aren't organized in the way our state system is. Um, and, you know, in some cases, um, you can end up in different places. Uh, those of you that follow the issue know that, you know, that New York, you know, working up state regulations this last year, uh, winter, Governor uh, Cuomo said, we're not going to adopt state regulations. So in effect, it's not going to be an issue for local governments because we're just not going to issue permits under regulations for this activity. But it had already arisen through the New York courts on local governments adopting zoning regulations that say, in our zone, in these zones, we're not allowing any oil and gas activity. Is that valid or not? Um, there's a preemption provision in the local courts, but it went up to the highest Court of New York, the New York Court of Appeals, and the New York Court of Appeals said, well, even though there's a preemption provision in the oil and gas law, the home rule provisions and our prior decisions under New York law say local governments can regulate and under some circumstances ban these activities. So, you know, if you were just reading the law, you would you would have a division of opinion. In fact, it was not a unanimous opinion. But in New York, it's clear that local governments um, do have some authority over, over where these activities might occur and how they might occur. Neighboring uh, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania jumped in in a big way to, to hydraulic fracturing for oil and or gas, particularly in the Marcel Shale. They already had an oil and gas law that preempted most local regulation, but in 2012, they passed one that had a whole new chapter that preempted every, it made um, fracturing for oil and gas um, uh, used by right in every zoning district in the, in the Commonwealth, residential, commercial, 
industrial. It had certain restrictions that applied in the in the residential commercial, but it was a use as of right in those areas. Uh, so it was not only the existing preemption, but four other sections of preemption to make sure no way, no how, are the local governments um, able to affect this because the state government enacted a con what they considered a comprehensive scheme under which this would occur. It was challenged by um, local municipalities and by others. Uh, last year, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court struck down all those new preemption provisions. They, they retained the old one, which allowed some space for, uh, for planning and zoning, and where the scope of local government is, uh, regulation is still somewhat up for grabs. They struck down all the new ones. They had two different theories. One was, for the first time, they interpreted the Pennsylvania Environmental Rights Amendment to strike down state law. Uh, a plurality of state Supreme Court says, uh, the state legislature has just wiped out all the local government's ability to make uh, these distinctions in adopting planning and zoning because, you know, although they have an obligation to consider environmental values and protection of citizenry and so forth, by making it as of right everywhere, they've done away with that law, it violates that part of the state constitution. The concurring justice, which gave them the majority, said, I don't have to reach the environmental rights amendment. Under due process, essentially, you've eliminated all due process, substantive due process, which is still alive and well in Pennsylvania, um, makes this an invalid act of preemption by the state government. And then, so, so from having, you know, five sections of preemption, now they're back to limitations. Um, but it's clear the local governments do have some ability to address planning and zoning. The issue arose in Texas. Uh, you know, oil and gas, friendly a long time. City of Denton had had some bad experiences. Adopt a ban. The uh, Texas uh, uh, legislature uh, just passed this past month, and the governor signed a law saying, nope, it's all preempted. And Oklahoma did the same thing. Um, Litigation in Ohio on a law similar to Pennsylvania's old law is preempted in Ohio. So your mileage may vary because you've got to look at what the preemption law is, you know, how far did it intend to go, what are all the state court decisions dealing with preemption. Um, but because these local powers derive from the state government, um, you know, the state has a substantial amount of control over whether local governments get to say anything at all, but even so, they may run into problems with the state constitution or other other provisions of state law that may conflict. Um, last issue um, I want to touch on is federal regulation of land use. So I've talked state and local. Is there any federal? You know, here we are in the national capital. Um, there is some. Uh, the federal government has plenary power over the federal domain. That is, the, if the feds own it, for the most part, the feds can control what is done with it, like a landowner, but, but with a landowner that's constitutionally charged with uh, administering that, that public domain land. So uh, if the Forest Service or the Park Service wants to administer uh, or your land management, they're administering it, um, they have land use power over their own land and the activities that occur there. Now, Congress can direct them to do certain things uh, and has, but, but the federal agencies are carrying out those land use regulatory authorities over the federal domain. There are other federal land use regulatory authorities, some many touched on in the other segments of uh, summer school series, Endangered Species Act, uh, regulatory things can affect activities on privately owned land in a significant way if, if those privately act, uh, private activities uh, may result in jeopardy or take, uh, or takings rather, takings to uh, uh, listed species, um, issues of uh, wetlands regulation, uh, uh, the need for federal permit from the Army Corps of Engineers will profoundly affect your ability to engage in uh, 
local land development activities. Even if you got all the local permits from your planning and zoning authority, uh, if if you're um, uh, dredging and filling on water in the United States, you need approval from the Army Corps of Engineers uh, under either a specific or general permit. So, you know, it's a big contested issue right now because the federal uh, EPA and the Corps just issued a regulation trying to define more explicitly what is a water in the United States. Uh, Low of these many years after the Clean Water Act term occurred. It's a local land use, or it is a land use regulation in effect, but it is not directed at regulation of land use. It is directed at protection of the quality of the waters of the United States. But the effect of, of it can affect uh, pretty substantially one's ability to engage in um, land activities. Um, and there are other regulatory authorities. The most direct um, legacy of, you know, should we have a federal land use sort of law was that actually a debated issue at the same, you know, that same early 1970s era when we got NEPA and the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act, you know, and all these things that people like me have made our, uh, our entire careers out of. Um, there was a move to do some federal land use planning uh, or, or directing states or enabling states to engage in planning that would be environmentally protective. What survived of that because of the political jurisdiction at the time was uh, the Coastal Zone Management Act of 1972. And the Coastal Zone Management Act um, arose because uh, of the, the, the proponent um, of, of the bill um, was um, a senator who um, chaired uh, that committee in the Senate and so was able to deal with coastal zone issues. And there was understanding that things like oil terminals and national defense and other activities along with state, you know, all the development of the country, much of it has been on the coast, uh, raised this set of issues where federal and state land use needs and desires might come into conflict. So the CZMA actually established an approach which funded states to develop uh, coastal management plans in the coastal zone. And in addition to giving money, said, if you do that, you can also state, uh, develop a set of enforceable laws and policies. Enforceable policies is the oxymoronic uh, description of that, but it's, it's pretty much enforceable laws and regulations for what the state wants to happen in the coastal zone. And we, the federal government, when we're engaged in a federal activity with an impact on the coastal zone, will submit our, our plan to you for a federal consistency review by you, the state. You can tell us whether what we're going to do is consistent with your enforceable policy. So it was a, a giving up or sharing, to some respect, of federal plenary authority to do pretty much what we want to do we're building the Navy base here, you know, and that's the way it's going to be, you know, with federal consistency. If, if there's a coastal management plan and there are enforceable policies, um, those activities will be submitted for federal consistency review. And typically, some modification or give and take or on, on what it's going to be. There is a federal ultimate trump card uh, that, that the federal government can play. It's in the interest of national security. Um, you know, ultimately, there's a trump card that can be played um, on that. But so we do have um, some remnant of this federal policy because the feds funded uh, and helped support the development of and are to this day funding activities to help the states carry out coastal management plans. And the coastal zone in some states is just a small ribbon of things that you see the board block and the sand, but in others uh, goes many, many counties uh, deep uh, where sea walls are never seen. Um, um, so uh, it's pretty relevant. The other relevant area of federal planning that I want to mention because it's influential is federal transportation planning. So most federal uh, transportation money flows through the states. Um, states engage in uh, development of transportation improvement plans um, and the elements of the development of that plan under the federal 
uh, transportation laws that are way overdue for renewal, by the way, editorial comment. Um, uh, we're operating under a two-month extension right now as a nation, which is not a good way to uh, plan and fund the transportation infrastructure for the 21st century. But the, um, require the development of, of plans uh, and help fund uh, metropolitan planning organizations uh, in, in the large urban areas and uh, urban uh, or uh, rural uh, planning in some of the rural areas which deal with a very extensive analysis of population growth, transportation need, impacts on the environment, consistency with the Clean Air Act, because uh, there's a great deal of issue with, um, you know, or building large highway things or we impairing our air quality. So uh, consistency with the Clean Air Act. All these things get rolled into these uh, planning documents which then go up through the state process and then to the feds for funding um, with uh, federal gas tax and other appropriated uh, funds. That can influence uh, significantly the extent to which at least data are gathered and at least to which transportation uh, at least to take it, takes into account land development scenarios. Um, and in fact, the metropolitan planning organizations have become, in effect, for many areas, regional repositories of data that can be used by municipalities in their ordinary uh, kind of planning activities. So a, a, a strong federal influence, but not a federal land use planning uh, uh, law or activity. It, it disclaims uh, any attempt to do that, and it, and it really does not. Uh, do that in terms of saying where uses shall be or how intense they will be. So um, I'm, that's it for the remarks, and I would be happy to entertain any questions or discussions that we have. Do we have any uh, from the phone or webinar? Yeah, we have one from the webinar. Um, and this goes back to kind of the first session, that, first section that you were talking about. Um, <clears throat> one of the webinar participants asked for a clarification of the Dillon Rule. Um, her understanding there was judicial precedent and that it could not really be challenged as far as that goes. Is that a correct understanding? So the Dillon's rule is a colloquial term um, that people have used uh, simply because Judge Dillon stated a version of this rule that was used a hundred odd years ago. Um, but the, Dill the Dillon's, Dillon's rule is basically the proposition that I stated that the local government has only the powers expressly dedicated uh, delegated to it uh, by state law, and those powers necessarily imply. What those words mean uh, turns out to have undergone a great deal of development in different states. And because the rule is not a federal or uniform rule, um, the evolution of that rule is very, very different in different states. So you'll see on a list that Maryland and Virginia are both Dillon's rule states, but the powers that each of those local governments have are extremely different. Virginia local governments have to go to the General Assembly for almost any kind of change. Most Maryland uh, uh, governments exercise a great many powers as implied powers. Um, that's the best I can do, I think, on that. Thanks. Yeah. Other questions? So questions or comments or, or new topics. We haven't talked, you know, local government regulation of climate change issues or energy efficiency. Or, so, please. Club you into submission. <laughs> uh, just curious to know about what your thoughts are on how to approach environmental justice issues with, with respect to land use. If you could talk about that for a moment. Yeah, so how best to approach environmental justice issues with respect to land use? So I think the best way to uh, approach those is if comprehensive plans can be amended to recognize uh, environmental justice as a, one of the many planning goals, because that then gives everything that follows from that a foothold. Um, in, into these activities. So the next time there's a rezoning, um, you can point to the comprehensive plan and say, how does this advance or not advance environmental um, just planning goals? So articulating that in a comprehensive plan addition or amendment would be helpful. 
Um, some of the other uh, approaches would be um, uh, where the local government can afford to do it or where a foundation or other funder can provide data um, that identify those impacts to make sure that the planning and zoning staff are available or have, have the data or information available uh, so that they can possibly incorporate it in those decisions. And then it's a political issue as to driving them to uh, engage in, in uh, those kinds of issues. The other is the community organizing thing so that if there's an expectation in the community that those who are submitting you know, site plan approval. Many communities, as a matter of practice, require community association, or it's good practice if you're citing something new, you touch base with the community association and others. And if it becomes a matter of expectation and practice that we want to see your environmental justice plan or mitigation as you, the, the new commercial development, or you know, you, the new gentrification uh, enterprise, are engaged in. Um, you'd like to establish that expectation going going in as a matter of community practice. Um, so, so it's like anything. Um, there is not, for the most part, at the local level or the state level, an environmental justice guarantee law. And in the absence of that, we then need to go in. I think through these other avenues. Do you, do you have any uh, practices that you would add to that or suggest? Um, I think off the top of my head, I'd probably say no, but I am doing a lot of research in that area, so I anticipate being able to think through some things. Uh, it's, it's true that some of the data is not out there, or it's not collected and not available to community organizers or people who are putting together comprehensive plans, so that's certainly an issue. Um, but there's also an issue of participation, right. that any, any uh, that there are opportunities to participate, but that many uh, minority communities don't just don't participate, or they don't know about it, or it's not done in their language, or it doesn't seem relevant uh, to them. So that's where I think uh, there needs to be more work done, getting participation increased. California a few years ago, and I don't know if this is still a good law, or when I had a court decision, and I think it was implementing regulations that required their review, which is dovetail with environmental impact review, be provided and available in languages that the community dealt with, which, you know, address that specific issue, which we may not have in other places. The other thing is, to be honest, that while all these, um, and uh, these public uh, involvement things uh, take place, if the meetings are not held in a way that people can get, or people have day jobs or other things to do, you know, are you going to be able to get organized, or are you going to be able to, you know, show up and, and say, this is not good for our neighborhood because I'm worried about the effect on, you know, school children or whatever may happen. That's not as effective as a developer or an or organizer who has organized whatever data will support the, the objective that they're after, which is why you know, establishing expectations in the comprehensive plan uh, and in the planning procedures, you know, will help you because it's great if you can get um, the data development paid for by those seeking the change in land use approval. You know, I don't want to be understood as making life difficult for developers, but uh, in fact, if there's an expectation, and there usually is, you know, you'll do a traffic study and You'll do what will the effect be on groundwater and stormwater runoff. You know, what will be the effect on housing affordability would be nice or jobs or disproportionate impacts on uh, minority and other disadvantaged communities would be an element. Yeah, another question. Other than making it a, um, a goal of the comprehensive plan, how uh, would you describe the, the existing footholds or uh, models for sustainability? There are a great many um, models and footholds for sustainability, and there are a great many sustainability networks, including a network of, of city sustainability coordinators. There's a mayor's network um, that also addresses those issues. Uh, there are uh, organizations like uh, ICLEA, uh, ICLEA, and others that um, 
uh, have established communities of practice or expectations or norms. Um, sustainability uh, is understood in different ways and not all municipalities pursue the same elements with the same degree of interest or rigor. It's often uh, pursued you know, by university towns because of interest by the people that live there and are, know the literature. It could be pursued as a competitiveness issue. How can we be energy efficient or provide communications infrastructure uh, it can be driven by, um, you know, as in Philadelphia and, and you know, D.C. to some extent, um, is driven in part by we have combined sewer overflow problems that are going to cost billions of dollars to rectify, and why don't we deal with green infrastructure? And while we're doing green infrastructure, let's not just put up green roofs, but let's make the entire area more attractive or livable and deal with transportation at the same time. So sometimes there are issues that are entry issues that provide a, a, an area um, of, of um, development of additional or ancillary issues. A very rich area of practice, um, uh, and I'd be happy to follow up with any of you who want to talk further. We did. <clears throat> There's one question online I'd like to get to, and I think that'll be our last question of the session. Um, and it was about climate change. It was kind of a lengthy question, but if you could just maybe give an overview of, you know, real quick, what, what's going on with climate change. The question specifically addressed if there was any federal scheme to have some sort of uniformality between uh, climate change, resilience, or adaptation plans. So I'm going to put this in the context of local land use planning and zoning decision making because they're, I mean, in addition to federal executive orders and other activities at the federal level and the federal family, I mean, there's a great deal of interest in federal activities and coordination. Um, there is not a great deal of direct translation of that into things that local governments will need to do or be driven towards doing. So there again, the most robust addressing of climate change has come from either local governments taking it on on their own because their citizenry is interested in it, uh, or because it's coming from state governments that have done statewide climate adaptation plans, as in Maryland or Delaware or California, uh, many others, um, uh, some of which impose requirements on local governments uh, in terms of their planning zoning activities. In, in other places, it's arisen with the local governments that we're getting flooding every year. Our, our water supply is about to be underground. Uh, uh, you know, how are we going to deal with this? Or we're about to pay a great deal of money to reconstruct our waterfront drive. All the climate models show us that our, our third street is going to be our waterfront drive. And so um, uh, addressing those infrastructure issues uh, has become uh, of interest and uh, acute. There may be, and we'll see whether there's an ability to tie any federal funding uh, to, to where the feds are paying for infrastructure uh, to those issues so that the federal and state investment is not swamped by uh, storm events or repeat losses. But again, this is a very, very uh, active, uh, fertile issue of development, but where uh, most of the activity is city, states, uh, universities, foundations, environmental law institutes, and others identifying one another uh, to, to act on this. And I see we're at the end of the hour, if not one minute over. So let me thank you all for your staying uh, with me. And I know you all join me in thanking Jim for this uh, dynamic presentation today. So yeah, on behalf of ELI's Pubs and Associates program, thanks Jim for being here. Thanks all of you for being here in attendance. And thanks to those of you who joined us on the webinar. Um, you'll get an evaluation on this session. Please do fill that out. We love to hear your feedback. If you have any seminar ideas for future topics you'd like to see covered, please email me at cordy at eli.org, K-O-R-T-E at eli.org. Um, and then one final thanks again to Jim and the DC Bars Environment, Energy, and Natural Resource section for co-sponsoring. 
And I'd be completely remiss if I didn't remind all of you students in the audience that ELI has free student membership while you are a student. So sign up, take advantage of all those great resources. Thanks for coming and have a great afternoon.